Oh, all the positive vibes are there. How are yeah. you? Good, good. Yeah. It's great to be uh, in the sun now, finally. Exactly. So you're in Sofia? Yes. Okay. Um, it's the first time we are having a guest from Bulgaria. We'd love to hear a little bit more about your, uh, what brought you to venture capital and about you know, your, your way to do things, your route, and, and what attracted you to this area, to this market. Sure, yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to participate in this initiative. Um, so my background has mostly been in finance and investing. Um, and right before launching Brightcap, I also worked for a B2B procurement startup. Uh, so Brightcap and venture capital was kind of like a natural continuation um, of my career path and um, kind of like a convergence of all my uh, various experiences from the past in one. Uh, but just to give you a little bit more background, um, I was born and raised in Bulgaria, but left for college in the U.S. right after high school um, and ended up staying there for 15 years. So um, got a, a U.S. citizenship. So now I'm a dual citizen um, and consider the U.S. actually as my second home. <clears throat> um, I worked. Uh, my first job was actually in investment banking. Um, it's Alma Smith Barney. Um, in New York, where you also worked. Um, yeah, that was my first job as well in New York, yeah. in Salomon Smith Barney. Right. And, and as you know, you know, after a few years of a lot of sleepless nights um, and a lot of work and a great learning experience, you kind of think maybe that's not um, a lifelong experience that you, <laughs> you want to have. So um, I moved to another bank, actually, uh, where I joined the research department. Um, it was a, a startup um, investment bank. It was the first for its time online investment bank uh, backed by Goldman Sachs. Um, and I joined their research team. So I covered e-commerce and technology companies like mm -hmm. eBay, eToys, and some others. Um, and I think that's when my interest actually um, was born in, you know, in technology and innovation, and the dig digital world um, as a whole. Um, it was very interesting to observe, you know, how these new startups were transforming traditional industries, how they themselves were growing and uh, evolving. Some, you know, uh, succeeded and thrived. Others, you know, died out uh, in the meantime. Um, and, and then in 2001, uh, when the dot-com collapsed, um, I decided to do my MBA. So I went to Stanford to the West Coast um, and spent two years there. Uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. So I took a lot of very many different classes, including, you know, African cinema, art, uh, you know, did a lot of different projects with uh, local firms. And one in particular was very interesting to me. I worked for a private equity firm uh, in San Francisco and decided I liked that by side um, feeling kind of taking ownership of, of your work and the development of a real tangible project. Uh, so after I graduated, I moved to New York. I joined a private equity firm there um, and worked for a few years. And eventually I, I moved back to closer to home. I moved to London first, uh, where I worked for another fund, which was a billion and a half investing in Europe. And because I was from Bulgaria, I traveled a lot to the region and eventually got pulled back to my country of origin. Um, I came about eight, nine years ago, um, started working for a startup here, um, which was in the procurement sphere. So we grew the business uh, to service businesses in different, like 20 different sectors. Uh, so I got a feeling of the entrepreneurial uh, world, uh, firsthand experience. And then Brightcap uh, came uh, about two years ago. Um, so that kind of combined all of my experiences in one. And, and I thought it was a good opportunity to, uh, to have an impact also on the local ecosystem and use my uh, kind of various experiences to, to grow that. So you're so. actually bringing a lot of, uh, of your past experience from US technology, from looking at that sector, from investing back to the home region, back to Central Europe. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I view that as a great you know, combination of all of those. So very yes. excited I got, I got the opportunity because eight, nine years ago, there was no VC industry here, you know. Uh, it's still relatively new. There are not that many funds. 
Uh, but, you know, there's a lot more capital now than before and the ecosystem is thriving. There are a lot more entrepreneurs because there's a lot more capital. So it's, you know, it's, it's evolving uh, quite well. And the skills of Bulgarian engineers, software engineers, data scientists have become very well known. Yeah, I think, I mean, all of, all of our countries from, you know, Central and Eastern Europe, you know, we have that kind of, traditionally, we have been very strong at math and sciences, at uh, engineering. So uh, we're very happy to say that I think we're like number three in the world uh, by IT engineers per capita. Uh, and because of that also, because of our socialist kind of uh, background, we also have a lot of women actually involved. Mm -hmm. We have about 50% of women in, in sciences, 50% of women in management positions. Uh, I think we have about 30% of women in the IT uh, sector, which I think is double the average of Europe. So um, we are very lucky to, to have inherited that. Uh, from, from the past. That's a nice position to start. Yeah. But tell us a little bit more about BrightCap and uh, your area of focus. And also, I guess, leading on to that, mm -hmm. what kind of founders or companies would be best positioned to reach out to you at what stage and where should they be from? And, and then in the end, how is it best to do it? Sure. Um, so, so I think just to give you a little bit of background on BrightCap, we are funded by the largest uh, European fund of funds, the European Investment Fund. Uh, and as with all of their funds, uh, we have uh, a restriction to invest in companies that have some Bulgarian presence. Um, usually uh, that's the tech team because of our historic uh, talent there. Uh, but we also raised some private money. So we have a pocket of money that we can invest in companies that are um, not connected and have no setup here in Bulgaria. Uh, we uh, have two different instruments. So we have an accelerator and an early stage uh, uh, compartment. So we can invest in different types of companies, more mature companies, but also companies that are uh, starting to grow their businesses. Um, and uh, having said that, you know, even though we have that restriction with the Bulgarian tech team, uh, we actually invest globally. So what we try to find is founders that are globally positioned where the markets and the customers are. Uh, usually a lot of these companies have a Bulgarian connection, like one of the founders is a Bulgarian and has nostalgia towards, you know, uh, their home country. Uh, also, they see the benefit of using the tech talent here, leveraging, you know, mm -hmm. the skills. Uh, it's still a fraction of the cost uh, in Silicon Valley or anywhere else in Western Europe. Um, so our winning formula is we invest in companies that are globally uh, located where the markets are, but typically they have a tech team here. Not always. Some of them don't have. Some of them come and start, open up an office here. Um, we have one company that has no... Uh, operation here in Bulgaria may never have one, uh, but you know they're still investigating the possibilities of hiring uh, local talent. Um, and otherwise, we don't specialize in one vertical uh, because of the limitations of our market. We're not a very big country, as you know, and not that many Bulgarians um, globally. But uh, that gives us an opportunity to look at very many different um, companies in different areas. Um, we like software companies. Uh, we, we like B2B and enterprise because that's easier to export and grow. Um, B2C, we've invested in B2C companies, but they usually have a B2B angle uh, or they, uh, you know, they, they are located, for example, in the US or somewhere where big markets um, and a lot of customers exist. Uh, in terms of how to reach me, you can, uh, you know, LinkedIn uh, is the best way, uh, you know, if there is interest and if the company fits our investment criteria, then uh, we can connect via email. Uh, founders can send us their pitch deck. And if we decide there's a fit, we organize calls and then uh, later on meetings. And that's how we do it. But we've seen in the two years that we've existed, we've seen about 500 different companies in so many different sectors. And we've invested only in eight of them. So not being a, not, uh, you know, specific in a vertical gives us that opportunity to look at many very different uh, companies. 
And actually, in terms of stage, you can look very early because you're for, of your accelerator program. Then you can look a little bit further up. And then obviously, I guess you're also looking at follow-ons to your investments. So then it's quite an array of different stages. Yes, we have a, an accelerator instrument that can invest up to 200,000 um, euros. Um, that's about 3 million of the, of the money that we've raised. Uh, and the bigger part of our capital is actually allocated to seed investment. So we do seed series A rounds um, and there we can invest up to three and a half million. But the idea of the accelerator is to actually back a company at the beginning, see how they grow for a year, a year and a half. And then if they're successful, we top them up through the bigger uh, instruments. Um, and we also uh, have decided to put aside 30 to 40% of the fund for follow on investments. So we want to see our companies uh, throughout their journey. We don't want to spread thin and invest in many companies. We want to select a few and take them from beginning to end, so to speak. So we want to participate in all of their rounds. If we can, obviously we have some limitations on the, given the fund size, but this is our strategy. In a way, being sector agnostic allows you to do everything. So you can choose the right founders and the right project better. Is that the way you are thinking and operating? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if we necessarily choose the better projects, but we definitely have more options. Uh, we'd like to think we choose uh, very good projects. Uh, like I said, we've list looked at 500 companies and uh, in many different areas. Um, and, and just to give you a little bit of, a, of an idea where we invest, we have a fintech company, we have a 3D point cloud automation startup, uh, we have a data science femtech company, uh, a cloud storage optimization, a website optimization platform. Um, we have a streaming pay-per-view platform for sports and music. Uh, a digital um, solution for air cargo um, and a business integration platform uh, that we actually exited uh, about a year ago. But we are in very many different sectors and we like to invest opportunistically. Uh, we obviously cannot be experts in every one of those fields that I mentioned. So what we've done is we formed partnerships with, um, with different um, uh, industry experts and companies uh, that can help us validate uh, those products and give us some industry insights. Uh, like we have a partnership with a retailer, uh, with uh, logistics companies, with uh, trading uh, experts, uh, film and uh, movies. You know, we have selected a few areas where we think there are trends for innovation and uh, uh, startups to develop and we validate those products with those experts. Okay, that, that's, that's great. And uh, once you invest, what is it like to work with you? What is your approach? What's your secret sauce in terms of the partnership with the founders? So I think all of us have this entrepreneurial background, which I think is, is important to, um, to, to have some under understanding and empathy towards the founders. Um, we also choose founders that come from the industry. So we trust them. We know they have deep knowledge and understanding of the problem they're trying to solve. So we don't try to micromanage them. We kind of were there if they need help uh, with, with an issue, but we don't uh, lead them on or handhold them uh, throughout the process. Uh, and I think one interesting uh, differentiator for our fund is the composition of our team. Uh, I mean, we all have the entrepreneurial background, but I think each one of us has a special set of skills uh, like one of my partners is a technical guy. He, uh, you know, built and sold two companies. So when we do due diligence, he digs deep in the technical aspect. He does uh, a very deep technical due diligence. And later on, he can help with uh, providing some advice uh, on that front. Um, my other partner is more of a tech sales and business development um, expert. Um, he worked for an Israeli startup, uh, Mercury, that was sold to HP for like 4 billion, I think. So he brings that experience with him. Um, my background is more in finance and investing, uh, you know, can provide guidance with, uh, you know, deal structuring, fundraising, budgeting, modeling, all that. Uh, and we also have a venture partner who um, uh, is the managing director at VMware uh, for R&D centers in the region. So 
she can bring more of a big picture kind of um, uh, perspective and validate some of the products uh, in big um, corporate environments. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a large network of contacts. You know, we have one of the partners is Israeli, so he has a connection with Israel. We formed some partnerships with local VC funds. We co-source uh, and share ideas together. Uh, and all of us have worked and studied or both, you know, in the States. So we have that connection to, um, to the US. We have a satellite set up in Silicon Valley where uh, we help our companies um, um, set up an operation if they don't have one yet, uh, grow their businesses, meet customers, uh, you know, do some marketing. So I think we bring that bridge to our companies to go to the US um, eventually. So I think this is kind of our uh, set of skills that we bring and try to help our portfolio companies grow. That's actually super important, a few of the things you said. One thing is that I think European funds still lack uh, people with in-depth technical skills who are able mm -hmm. to really assess the technology, the IP behind. Uh, it's typical in the US, but in Europe, yeah. I think we're still behind in terms of this. Uh, mm -hmm. The second thing you said was the network. Uh, you mm -hmm. have an immense network, uh, also because of the of the partners that are in the fund and and the other uh, people around it. And this bridge uh, moving across the Atlantic is, is super important. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree, but what we are seeing is that companies in Central Europe have amazing software skills, amazing engineering, amazing ideas but the market is not here. You need to sell those ideas exactly. elsewhere. And then you need to be close to those clients who are actually buying it. I guess exactly. we are a little bit behind in terms of technology adoption, uh, if you think about it from a sales standpoint, and therefore it's super important to be networked out there. Um, yeah, exactly. And that, that's why our satellite set up there, we actually have cohorts. So we put together a number of companies and they're taught how to sell, how to market, they're put in touch with, you know, partners there. Um, because, it, I mean, I'm sure you know, like European founders are very technically savvy, but like you said, they don't really know how to sell to those big markets and uh, in the US especially. So uh, that's a skill that they're still uh, kind of developing and they obviously need the warm connections and uh, introductions to, to uh, companies there. So that's very valuable, I think, for, for European companies. We also co-invest, uh, you know, we have four companies in the US uh, and in all four of them, we have a co-investor. So it's a, a, a US venture capital firm that co-invested with us, which also brings exposure to the whole European ecosystem, right? So these VCs are warming up to, you know, investing in companies outside of the US. Um, and so they're seeing a lot of mm -hmm. successes in Europe and, uh, and kind of, it's, 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 uh, I think it's a good trend to have. Yeah, definitely. It works both ways. You are helping your companies and then uh, yeah. you are also building this bridge for those VCs out there to come over to Central Europe. That's very good. Yeah. What do you think are the kind of exciting segment sectors, trends at the moment in the European technology landscape uh, for startups? What excites you? Um, I think, I mean, first of all, Europe, I think, uh, is becoming uh, more and more visible uh, in terms of uh, investing in, in venture capital and private equity. Um, I think last year, there was uh, about a hundred billion that was invested in Europe. Um, I mean, a part of that was in VC deals, I think like 15% or so, but that year over year is growing. So last year, I think there was a 20% growth over the previous year. So uh, again, you know, there's a lot more activity than there used to be before. In terms of trends, uh, I think we see a lot of fintech, uh, you know, especially out of London, you know, there's Monzo, TransferWise, Revolut, SumUp, uh, N26 out of Berlin. So fintech is very big in Europe. Um, one of the companies that we invested in, uh, which is the only Bulgarian company actually based here, 
uh, also provides um, uh, fintech solutions to MFIs and banking institutions. They service clients in over 40 countries and have offices uh, in nine or 10 countries now. So fintech is big in Europe. Uh, I think another area where we see a lot of development is transportation and last mile deliveries. Uh, we have a few unicorns there. Uh, you know, we have blah, blah car out of uh, France. Uh, we have Cabify. We have some delivery um, uh, startups like Glovo uh, and Deliveroo, which provide, you know, food delivery and other products. So we see uh, a trend there as well, but that's a global trend uh, and it's catching up in Europe. Uh, we see development in deep tech and robotics, uh, you know, UI path out of Romania. Uh, that's a big success. Um, in agri and food, uh, again, another sector where globally there's a lot of development. Uh, there's a company in France that does uh, transforms insects into, you know, nutrient resources. That's a trend. We also have a Bulgarian company that is doing that as well. Um, so that's, that's, uh, there's great progress there. And I think that's going to continue with the population growing and food becoming scarce. Um, and in automation and digitalization, we see a lot of a lot of uh, growth there as people as companies are trying to be more efficient and cost effective. And especially now with COVID, uh, I think every company is trying to cut costs uh, and automation and digitalization does that. Uh, I think four out of the eight companies actually do some kind of automation um, and uh, make these processes more efficient. Uh, and obviously health tech and, you know, uh, femtech, you know, uh, there's a big surge in online medical assistance now with COVID, which I think afterwards will continue because if you can, you know, talk to your GP for a trivial question online, why waste time to go to their um, office, you know. Um, and, and there's a huge trend in personalization. So using AI and ML. Um, algorithms to personalize solutions to every individual or every uh, customer, be it a business or an end, end customer. So these are trends that they're, I think they're global trends, but uh, in Europe, they're also uh, very big. And uh, uh, we, being, being sector agnostic allows us also to follow those trends. And if a new trend emerges, you know, uh, since we don't specialize in one version, vertical another, we can very easily take advantage of that as well. You've invested in women-led startups. You've invested in this femtech one as well. That's a, that's a kind of typical, I would say, impact startup. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your approach and what you are thinking at the moment in terms of impact investing in the venture capital space? Uh, sure. I think, I mean, you know, of course, everybody wants to to do good in addition to make money. So and and so do we. Uh, I think inherent to our structure and and the fact that EIF is our anchor investor, uh, we uh, just have that impact on the local ecosystem here because um, all these companies that we try to um, sponsor and fund, they may be located globally, but we try to build tech teams here. So we create jobs for the local ecosystem. We bring exposure. Um, you know, we, we, we attract foreign companies also that have no Bulgarian connection uh, to Bulgaria to um, hire engineers and data scientists. So that's kind of an impact that creates also this new generation of entrepreneurs. Um, and in addition to that, um, we uh, also like having finding a company or solution that addresses an overlooked problem that uh, has a great impact. Uh, one such company is the Spanish company, Room, that we invested in. Uh, it's the only company with no Bulgarian connection whatsoever. Uh, so it's based out of Madrid, founded by two females, uh, one from Belgium and one from Honduras. So, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> nothing to do with Bulgaria. Uh, but what we liked is that uh, in addition to um, for them to, they figured out a way how to monetize um, this uh, impactful solution that they've created. Uh, they basically help women get pregnant uh, mm -hmm. now, but they're focusing on um, reproductive health issues throughout from contraception to fertility to menopause. So that's, you know, uh, in their plan uh, for the future. 
Um, and th since their inception uh, a few years ago, they've helped, I think about 50 now, maybe 60,000 women get pregnant. Uh, so that's a great impact that they've achieved. And in addition, they figured out a way how to monetize and be sustainable. So that data that they collect, um, in addition to helping women get pregnant, they also uh, analyze it. They use AI, ML algorithms. They analyze the data and they get some insights from the data that they can sell to pharma companies, clinical trial companies, uh, fertility clinics, so that they can help them better serve those customers. So it's kind of a win-win for both uh, the end customer, the woman, and also the businesses that serve those end customers. Uh, and also for us, because we're bringing them here, they're, um, they already set up an office here. They're hiring their first uh, engineers and data scientists, uh, which most of them are actually women because it's closer to them, right? So, uh, you know, that's kind of an impact from very many different angles. Uh, so we're proud to uh, have attracted a foreign company to Bulgaria uh, to create some impact here locally. That's brilliant. That, that's a great example. In terms of female founded projects, are you seeing more of them in general? Um, I, I can't really say. Uh, you know, I haven't done the statistics on in terms of five years ago and now, but uh, definitely there is a trend, I think, going in that direction. Um, I think, like, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of women in tech and sciences um, and math and um, uh, what they've done, a lot of them, in addition to just setting a good example for other women uh, to become leaders in, in their spheres, they also have launched uh, specific initiatives to uh, promote and motivate other women uh, to start their careers and develop their skills in technology and entrepreneurship. Um, so I think that's, that's a positive trend. Uh, what we also see here locally, especially is uh, we have six or seven funds and they are females uh, either as partners or in, you know, um, senior positions within those funds. Uh, so that, that kind of uh, helps female founders uh, reach the mm -hmm. that capital because, you know, Voom, which deals with fertility, uh, even though that's not necessarily just a female problem, but females are more uh, closer to it. So for them, it would be easier to explain and sell to um, a female uh, investor rather than a male investor. So I think as more and more women become investors, more and more females um, will find someone to listen to them. Um, and, and I think also another like long-term transition will take place, which is women kind of uh, venturing out of their comfort zone and uh, becoming more uh, risk prone because, you know, maybe they're more risk averse biologically speaking. But I just read recently a survey done by the World Economic Forum that said that women leaders have been better at fighting COVID uh, than male leaders, um, even though maybe because actually they're more risk averse, uh, but it manifests in a different domain. So they're more risk averse for saving lives versus economic outcome. Uh, so, so just a kind of a transition that, you know, women have to go through and uh, eventually will, I think, um, become more confident in taking more risks. Yeah, this is what I find is that leadership, when there are, when it's mixed, when there are women in leadership positions, they are not the ones that create wars. They are not the yeah. ones that create the crisis and they're not the ones that are creating the conflicts. Um, they are the ones that want to be there for the long term and just invest in the future. And I think that that is a, a woman thing. I think that having more women in technology and in venture will in the end have that kind of positive feel to it as well. So yeah, yeah. it's nice that in Bulgaria there are so many of them. That's, that's really great. Yeah, I, I think it's always good to have a good mix. It's not good to be one way or another. I think diversity brings very different points of view and it's always good for um, progress, I think. Yeah, it, it's supposed to create better results. And I think there's a few sure. now studies on that. So that, yeah. that's, that's a very interesting topic. Um, in terms of kind of a high level, what would you change around the venture capital today if, if you could? Um, that's a very good question. Um, maybe taking away borders. Um, I think still uh, today it's, it's still very geographically limited. 
uh, you know, US VCs investing in US companies, Asian VCs investing in Asian, European and European startups. Uh, I think that's changing obviously because, uh, uh, you know, they're very good companies starting out of anywhere in the world. Um, and um, I think we see that trend, you know, Sequoia, as you know, is opening up an office in London. Uh, so we see VCs opening up uh, their horizons and, and investing globally, but that's one thing. Uh, I think the, the world is just becoming more um, borderless. So uh, on any level, uh, I think that's probably going to be the trend in the future. That will be a very good one when that when that happens because technology knows no borders so exactly yeah yeah exactly fits that picture and in terms of the founders you're working with uh, i think you know uh it's always good to to understand a little bit what are the kind of qualities that you find important in them uh what do you look for and then I guess what I wanted to end on a final note as well was some advice to them. What is their, you know, it's, it's a difficult time at the moment uh, for founders, a very kind of unstable time. Um, so could you just talk a little bit through on the founders and your advice to them at this point? Um, I think uh, what I see lacking in a lot of founders, especially from our region is is, is their confidence and thinking big. Uh, we see a lot of uh, very talented people uh, kind of being more uh, insecure and starting small and uh, being afraid to think big. Um, but, but I think that uh, thinking big actually provides a direction uh, in which founders should go. I mean, uh, that's not to say being delirious, you know, but, you know, doing your homework, uh, you know, taking appropriate focus steps, but wanting something big, because that's the only way you can grow and develop and take over the world is uh, if you have a big ambition and you follow through. Um, I think another thing that Bulgarian entrepreneurs and, and maybe just European in general are just they're a lot more afraid of failure uh, than American counterparts. Uh, I think in the US failing is actually seen uh, as an opportunity to learn uh, and grow. Uh, while in Europe and particularly, you know, in our part, maybe I'm I can only speak to Bulgaria, but failing is, is kind of like a, a bad thing. You know, there's a stigma still about it. Uh, so I think if you think big, if you're not afraid of failure, uh, you can achieve a lot. Uh, if you do your homework, if you try to differentiate your product uh, and figure out whether you're really solving a problem that uh, people are willing to pay for, because, you know, you can have a solution that is a nice to have solution, but uh, if customers are not willing to pay for it, then it's not a sustainable business and you can't uh, be a leader and you can't uh, grow exponentially and take over the world. Uh, in, in terms of just now with COVID, um, I think Bulgarian founders have realized that, uh, again, maybe because historically we, we've lived through that to be more frugal uh, and um, be very... Uh, careful with uh, how they spend and where they spend uh, and focus on their core areas uh, and are on their one goal uh, and kind of uh, cut off all the extra uh, side kind of activities. Uh, so to be more laser focused for now to, uh, to be able to survive the crisis. Uh, I think the crisis is also actually bringing a lot of opportunities to some companies in uh, in different sectors. So there, they actually have the opposite problem, like how to grow and how to meet the increased demand. Uh, in 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 a time when things are uncertain, it's difficult to to understand whether you should hire a lot of salespeople, whether that's temporary, whether things are going to change long term or short term. Uh, so just my advice would be to be more careful on, on where you spend your money, but at the same time, don't miss the opportunity to grow if uh, uh, there's an opportunity that COVID presents. Okay, okay, brilliant. Alina, it's been great speaking to you. Uh, Likewise, yes. It's a great story. Um, looking forward to working with you and uh, let's keep in Me touch. Too. Thank you for your sure. time. Definitely, thanks Kinga. Have Take care. Day. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.